Hello, this is uh, Battalion Chief Wally, and this is a little class I put together for everyone. Um, it's about Type 5 construction, lightweight versus conventional. It's going to be a short little bit of a PowerPoint, and it's going to um, show a lot of photos and a little bit of discussion about some of the stuff we are potentially going to run into. And I hope you like it. Okay, the goals for this training is to increase construction knowledge, mostly in regards to lightweight and Type 5, a little bit of Type 2. Increase our ability to recognize construction types. Um, again, more focused on those types of construction. Application of this knowledge and operational time and considerations. What are the types of construction? They're listed as uh, types one through five. You can read them there. Um, fire resistive construction is going to be like hospitals or the mall or something along those lines, that new Lake Health building that they're building over by the high school. And, and basically what it does, it's, it's designed to limit smoke spread and limit fire spread to the area where it, uh, where it first began. It has a lot of like features such as like dual 5 ace drywall, fully sprinkler buildings, um, the structural members, be it steel, are coated with fire resistive materials, and uh, everything's alarmed and and so on and so forth. Um, type 2 construction is non-combustible. That's kind of our bread and butter up and down Tyler and uh, all the strip malls up on Mentor Avenue. In essence, it's just a, a non-combustible building. It can be uh, lightweight and more times than not, it's lightweight. So this is this is will be the buildings that you'll see that are like just brick on the sides, flat roofs, uh, that Q decking, and then built up tar or uh, the foam type insulation on top with rubberized roofings. They'll have metal trusses, bar and uh, steel bar joist roofs, you know, that type of stuff. Um, tilt slab construction, like at uh, Byers Products on Tyler Boulevard, is an example of a non combustible building. And these buildings, you know, can be fully sprinklered or not, and they can be more beefy than uh, less beefy. But for the most part, they're called non-combustible because none of the materials themselves will burn, but they'll fail quite fast, and they're not exactly safe for us to operate in. Type 3 is ordinary. Ordinary construction is no longer being produced. That's the old-style brick buildings that you'll see in, like, downtown Willoughby or some on Manor Avenue or some actual old wooden, or excuse me, uh, brick homes. Uh, like Amish Attic, that uh, Italian house up on Metter Avenue. And all um, walls are built of non-combustible materials. Uh, roofing members are uh, built of wood. Their, um, floor joists are built of wood. There's tons of concealed spaces in these buildings that uh, fire can spread. Uh, a lot of them, if they haven't been renovated, are covered in plaster and lath for the walls. They might have tin ceilings or hard to operate in. They might have a space between the ceiling joists of the top floor and, uh, and the roofing materials. Uh, sometimes they're called cockwalls or attics. But um, yeah, those are not really built anymore. Uh, type 4 is heavy timber. Again, that's pretty much exactly like Type 3, except it's a much more uh, beefy version. That's like Type 3 on steroids. Another one of the main differences is these buildings didn't really conceal their framing. So um, what they would do is just uh, leave everything wide open and uh, you'd see the giant heavy beams that were spanning around and columns all over. The only one that's kind of like this in our city is the Matchworks building and uh, that's kind of been renovated too. But a lot of the old type um, 4 heavy timber elements still exist there. And then lastly is type five, wood frame. Wood frame is basically anything built of wood. So this is the one that's kind of what we wanted to focus on or I wanted to focus on today. And it can, you know, like I said, can be lightweight and it can be uh, legacy or conventional. Okay, so if we focus on the, the type five construction and we look at uh, the difference between lightweight and new, versus uh, conventional legacy or older type of construction. A couple things stand out. Number one is lack of mass. So uh, a typical truss is made up of a two by four that's oriented in, in a truss configuration to span long distances and carry large loads with small materials. 
that lack of mass of each of those individual pieces of lumber that make up the truss burn through rather quickly. If you think of that compared to what a conventional or legacy homes two by 12 rafters that carried the roof, you know, how much longer would that two by 12 withstand fire versus a two by four? Um, also, the use of the type of lumber that they have nowadays is a fast growth type lumber. So it doesn't, it isn't allowed to settle or or live long enough to get their rings uh, within the lumber itself tighter and stronger versus the old uh, old growth lumber in the past. Then we have uh, suspect connection methods. So that's more of like the longs, along the lines of gusset plates, hurricane clips, um, roof clips, um, that type of thing that uh, is utilized. Uh, it's quite prolific in lightweight or new modern type of construction. And that, you know, the counterpart is full span lumber between load bearing walls and beams. So, you know, back in the older style homes, they would have the proper two by 10, two by 12, two by eight floor joists that were solid lumber. And they would carry to beams in the basement, which would then transfer down columns to, to footers. And, uh, and or they would rest on um, load bearing walls within the house. Nowadays, you know, due to these connection methods, they're able to span a lot further distance and don't need to have as many load bearing walls. Also, the sheeting materials in the newer type of uh, construction, lightweight construction, is, is quite a bit different. If you look at what old school uh, roofs were constructed of, like solid one by six that was nailed down to proper roof rafters, then it transitioned to uh, plywood, which was quite strong, and now it's down to OSB, which is Orient Strand Board, and that stuff is, is pretty flimsy, so much so that they've, they've lowered the amount of thickness that you can use as long as you clip it. And then, speaking along those lines, is relaxed codes versus tougher codes of the old days. There were numerous codes that were adopted throughout the United States, and uh, builders that were specking homes across the country were frustrated with the fact that if they you know, design a home in one region of the country, they'd have to design it differently. In, in another region because of different codes that were being used. Unified uh, Building Code versus the National Building Code and all sorts of others. I don't really know 100% off my hand, off hand right now, but what they ended up doing is combining all the codes and when they did that they took the least stringent of all the codes uh, to make builders follow nowadays. So here in the next two slides we have uh, pictures of two homes. So these two homes are right across the street from one another. And everybody that's worked here for a while would know that Maple Street is uh, an older street in our city and it's loaded with legacy construction homes. But this one right here, I virtually guarantee you that's lightweight construction. And we have that one across the street from this home that was probably built right around the turn of the century. So what does lightweight construction look like? Well, first off, it looks like areas you know that are in your city that are loaded with lightweight construction. So again, most people that have been around Manor for a while know what Newell Creek is, and that's, that's exactly what this is. This is a satellite video or footage picture of a Newell Creek. So over in this area here, this was like the first phase of Newell Creek and then over here is the new phase. Um, these two phases are both extremely full of lightweight construction. All of them are lightweight and uh, this is kind of what I said I wanted to focus on. These two buildings in here, one of them is Parker Place and one of them is another nursing home that changes names every single day. It, I think it's Atria right now. Um, over here is a new nursing home and this right here is uh, Avery Dennison. This actually is a type 1 fire resistant building. Uh, that's the only one in this area. Now, all the homes on this part of the street here are probably closer to being legacy even though the majority of those are probably going to be lightweight as well. Okay so this is an example of a type 5 lightweight construction home. Some of the things that might clue you in is, like I said, the location in the city should be your first guess if you know where it's located. 
well, areas in, in the city that are being built in this manner. You can also tell kind of by looking at the shape of the building if you, you know, pay attention to what older homes look like. They typically didn't look like this. But um, a lot of older homes didn't have attached garages. Not to say that attached garage homes are all lightweight, but it's something that you might be able to tell by, you know, just a quick glance. How about this building here? Everybody probably knows what that is. That's Parker Place. Um, this is 7960 Center Street. I showed you uh, in the overlay picture earlier uh, where this building was located. But if most people had to guess, I'd be you know surprised if they would come up with Type 5. But in actuality, this building is Type 5. This is a wood frame building, and it's all lightweight materials. This right here is the building next door. This is a uh, Atria of Menor. It was Brooksdale. It was Emeritus when it first was built. It looks the exact same. Built basically two years after Parker Place. Um, it is lightweight construction, but it is not Type Five. It is Type Two. This entire building is built um, with wooden, or excuse me, metal studs, metal floor joists, poured concrete floors, metal attic trusses. So, although it is lightweight, it is Type Two. This is another building that is on Center Street that's actually being constructed right now. It's on um, Center Street right by 7200 Polo Building or Station Street. Um, yeah, another example of Type 5 lightweight construction, but this is a commercial building. Same building. Um, it's good if you can see buildings under construction, so you know if you see stuff like this, you know it's lightweight and you know uh, how it's built as well. This was a photo of them setting a crane, or using a crane to set the trusses. All right, so when you look at construction sites, you can see some things laying around that'll give you a pretty good clue as to whether or not it's gonna be lightweight or conventional. Although, the best clue is the fact that if it's being built today, it's more than likely gonna be lightweight. This right here is a pile of pre-built walls. So, they'll be built off-site, laid, stacked up, and they just basically pick them up. They're numbered and they just set them in place according to the plans and throw their houses together. Here's another photo of a TJI. It's a laminated eye joist. So this is silent floor, super strong, span great distances. But if you look at this right here, this, this, uh, this used to be the top cord and the bottom cord used to be made of two by fours and then it was dropped down to two by threes and then one by threes now they're just using straight up plywood as the top and bottom cord of these uh, laminated eye joists and then they have these sections of of osb there there's a rabbit joint where they where they're where they're glued in so there's basically no mechanical fasteners in these at all it's all done by glue and these things are super super strong but they can also fail without any sort of flame impingement. So they're fairly dangerous and they'll fail really fast. I mean, this is like 3 a thick OSB. Plus if they're laying around the job site before they get installed and they get soaking wet, this wafer board is gonna chip. Look at all this damage on, on this OSB right here just from getting bumped around and stuff like that. I mean, this is, this is not the optimal material to build with, but that's what they're using nowadays. All right, here's a pile of trusses laid out on the ground. These things basically have no strength whatsoever until they're tied into uh, an entire roof unit. And this is an example of that commercial building yeah, over by 7200, which I talked about earlier. This is what the trusses look like as they're being installed. Um, I mean, look in this building, you know, through this window. This at least has two by six walls that are 16 on center. The majority of these newer type homes, type 5 lightweight homes, are built with 2 by 4 walls, and some of them are even set at 24 on center. Alright, this is a picture looking down a set of trusses. I mean, you can just see that they don't carry any strength at all. I mean, they're basically, lateral strength is, is zero. So they're nailed up to the walls. And then they're tied together with temporary framing until the sheeting comes on. And that sheeting is that OSB. Um, and again, it's, it's clipped together. The two pieces are as they, as they stack up the roof. 
and then they're then they're just covered in shingles and, and they just call it a day at that point but yeah they are definitely ripe for failure another picture of some trusses and just some of the warping and what they look like when they're shipped so these things are shipped this way and they're banded and put on trucks and and they're cranked down with those orange bands I mean just um, you could see here that you know these these ones here are shorter so this is, is pulled down as the bands are uh, ratcheted down for the transport. Does that damage them? I don't know. Does it pull the gusset plates back out on the uh, opposite end on this end? Possibly. All right, so this is a picture of a uh, laminated eye joist inside of the house that's over there in the new um, Newell Creek development. Take a look at this right here. This is a, the entire bottom cord is cracked in this building, but they just threw it up and just left it. So, you know, you can see the questionable construction methods that are even happening in these buildings. These rim joists right here, these, these are now um, OSB. I mean, this used to be at least a dimensional lumber. There's, in any of these homes being built nowadays, there's almost no real lumber. The largest diameter Lieutenant Bittner and I, and I found of any lumber inside of this house being constructed was two by six, and that was used as a window header. This is an example of what the beam looked like that's being used to carry the floor load and some of the second floor load um, inside of that house in Newell Creek. So they basically just carved out a, a slot for that to slide in, slid it in, and boom. Um, that's fine. Steel eye beams are good, and they're pretty common inside of homes nowadays. Here's an example of a steel eye beam laying down on the construction site. So here's a picture of that same house from inside the garage. It's got the poured basement floor, or basement wall rather, and then like I said, the rim joist itself is OSB. That's not even, you know, dimensional lumber. So think about how, you know, a small fire outside in the mulch, how that would react to this OSB. You know, this house is probably going to have uh, uh, vinyl siding on top of it. That's going to melt away. This OSB is going to start burning, and it'll burn right through that in seconds. And it'll be running laterally across that floor system probably before it even breaks into the house. So if you're coming from Station 3 or, or Station 1 to these area, you know, to Newell Creek or any area in that city for this matter the, with construction that's built like this, you know, a little smolder of mulch could be a, a huge fire raging inside of this floor system. And you could just have a light smoke condition upon arrival or you could have almost no smoke condition upon arrival, but rather just a, an odor investigation. And uh, you could walk into this building and fall through the floor into the basement. So it's, it's really important to just think about how these buildings are constructed and, and how you're going to operate within them. This is a picture of uh, the truss system in that house and just how expansive it is. You know, any fire that gets up the siding of a house and just say the same same scenario I just described, the mulch fire out the back of the back side of the house runs up the siding, burns up that siding almost immediately through the through the uh, vinyl soffit, and it's in this truss loft. How long is this going to survive? Anybody ever see this before? This is uh, called finger joint studs. It's a method of joinery. It's actually quite strong. If you were to take two pieces of wood and glue them together, you'd have the entire surface area of glue of two by four, right? But if you have these finger joints, you increase your surface area of gluing by an exponential, you know, a huge amount. And it does create a fairly strong joint. However, that glue can fail under heat conditions, even without fire. So when a stud is, is finger jointed and it's standing vertically, you know, the weight and the pressure is pushing down towards those fingers, but when this is laid flat, you know, those finger joints, you know, can fail and the, and the stud can drop. Where you'll see it, you know, laid flat is in truss systems, what they're doing nowadays. This is just a picture of a, of a stud uh, in a wall sitting vertically, but... All right, these are a close-up of the piles of trusses outside of the building, and this is um, a gusset plate. Those little gang nails there look like they go in pretty, 
pretty far into the wood, but it's actually like three eighths of an inch. So it's not even a half of an inch they extend into the wood. So think how much time it's going to take to burn that wood away to where the, those gussets will start pulling out. And not to mention when, when metal gets heated, it's going to curl and want to pull out. So that's why trusses are so dangerous. All right, this is another picture uh, similar to what I showed you in the last one where it's just that little rabbit. No mechanical fasteners at all in this entire um, laminated eye joist. This is a picture of what a joist hanger looks like. This right here is an LVL, which is laminated veneer lumber. These are actually very, 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 very strong. And uh, they'll last pretty long in fire. Um, they're like very thick plywood, basically, that, they, that they'll use to create beams. This, however, not so strong. So, again, think about you know, lateral fire spread. And um, when, when, they, when they frame this building out, they'll bring the electricians in. The electricians are going to, you know, drill holes in it. And then the plumbers are going to come. The, the plumbers are going to stick a pipe in this wide, but they'll drill a hole that big. So fire can spread through that building, you know, or through that, through that bay uh, rather quickly. Here's another example of a, the back side of that joist hanger. And then over here is another bit of joist hanger. This is a, a more up close look at the top view of what the gusset plates look like. So these just, these are basically stamped pieces of metal and they'll stamp out those little nails that'll protrude into the lumber and then they'll pound them in mechanically and that's what they'll use to hold these things together. And then here's some more of those, those methods of construction. So um, trusses work in a pretty simple principle. Um, loads are transferred around a triangle and uh, these top cords, which are, which are these up here, these are in compression and then these are in tension. So all the force is being pulled away from, from the center point here. Whereas these forces are being pressed into one another as they compress. So, and then this force of which would be a king, king truss uh, portion wants to push down. So that would push down and then it would be carried across this way to the walls and then these would compress and hold. So they actually, they're pretty, pretty genius how these things are made and, and they really, really can hold a lot of weight, but they just don't stand up. And, and think of how a little bit of fire here can spread across this entire attic space. All right, so this is an example of what a hurricane clip is, if anybody's ever heard of it. Basically, they were invented for areas of high winds, and more specifically hurricanes, and they were clipped to uh, the roof systems to keep them from ripping out. So this is the top plate of the wall here, and they'll get nailed in, and then they'll get nailed into the truss system. And this piece of metal here is, you know, it's fairly strong, but that's more for shearing off the roof of wind. All right, so this is a quick flow chart. And uh, this I got from Anthony Avilio. So this will show you, you know, how serious this is, you know. Is lightweight cons uh, construction present? No, then operate in a safe manner consistent with building construction and structural conditions. Yes, lightweight construction features involved or threatened. Yes, if they are, immediately withdraw from the area. Prepare for collapse and consider stop points based on fire extent and building layout. If not, increase supervision, which is to decentralize the fire ground, you know, operate cautiously, and continue to monitor the voids and reinforce the operation. Remember, it comes down to two things. Is it lightweight construction and is it involved or threatened? So basically what this is saying is, you know, if it's lightweight construction, is it even worth our time entering the building? That's, this is uh, Anthony Villio, who, if, if you don't know who he is, he was a district chief or deputy chief out of New Jersey on the other side of the river from Manhattan. So they, they had some lightweight stuff come in after, you know, years and years of, of conventional Type 3 buildings and things like that. So they're pretty well versed in this type of fire spread. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, if, if that's, what, uh, that's what they're saying, it's, it's probably pretty true. 
And if you look at any of the, spend some time studying the UL videos or the NIST stuff, you know, you'll see a lot of fascinating things. Some cities will actually mark their buildings that have trusses. I think in New Jersey, it's a state law that if you have a truss, you have to have a, a notation on the front of your building, you know, and then, but just lightweight in general is just so bad. I mean, like I described before, a mulch fire sitting on, you know, the back side of a building catches the siding on fire, runs up the siding into the into the attic space, or and then it uh, burns through what used to be the rim joist. Now it's just a sheet of OSB, and it's burning inside of the uh, the laminated eye joist bays, and it's running laterally. You know, if it only stays in that floor system, you get called for an odor investigation in the house, and you might have a ripping fire, or light smoke condition on your arrival. You know, or it runs all the way up the side, and it's in your floor system, and it's in your attic. You know, I mean, how much how much time are you going to give that as an officer? How much time are you going to operate in that building? You know, how much more are you going to rely on potentially considering using a transitional attack or hitting it from outside to see if you get a definite change? You know, and furthermore, if you pull up on an old style house and you have light smoke showing, like diffuse leaving the building, and no discernible spots. You know, is that a vent limited fire or is that a a concealed space fire? Is it just a you know something burning on the stove fire? These are a lot of a lot of things to consider when we when we pull up on these fires. But if you know your buildings and know your areas, you know you'll give consideration to operating times in these buildings, and you might want to rely on on uh, you know, knocking any visible fire out you know, before you even enter the building really paying attention to your 360s, using your thermal imagers. If you're using a thermal imager on your 360 and you're going around a building and you're and you're seeing registers in, of heat in the fire room and as you go around the, the building, you're not seeing any colder windows or anything that appears to be cooler, then what's the survivability in that building? You know, is it is it worth entering? You know, I mean, or is it going to, Enter your mindset as to how long you're going to allow your crews to operate in those buildings. All right, here's another picture of uh, two LVLs sitting on top of a wall frame, or excuse me, double wall plate. But there's only one stud that's carrying these uh, LVLs, so they're not even terminating correctly. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about is 13R sprinkler systems and uh, what they are and how they differ from from an actual 13, NFPA 13 sprinkler. All right, so what is a 13R sprinkler system? In essence, buildings are only partially sprinklered. Um, they don't require attics, closets, or bathrooms to be covered. That means that there's no heads in there. Void spaces and flooring systems aren't covered. So basically what I just talked about. Um, even beyond the laminated eye joist that I showed you, they're using just parallel cord stud truss systems for floors and those are just wide open from one side of the building to the other side of the building from corner to corner I mean anything that gets in there you know there's no sprinklers heads inside of those buildings if it's a commercial building and it has a 13R system in it so if a fire gets into that area it'll just run right through there and could potentially you know be burning in there for quite some time before it's even noticed these buildings that, you know, use these 13Rs are also required to have some stuff called draft stopping. And, and basically what that is is caulking and various uh, uh, measures to make sure that smoke or any heat can't get beyond the compartments into those areas. But, I, you know, I, I wouldn't trust it. I mean, there's been buildings that have been dropped to the ground with these types of sprinkler systems in them. Um, smaller piping sizes are required for these. For the 13R system, they require a shortened water supply duration. So that basically means they probably won't need fire pumps, or have them, and they're cheaper to operate or cheaper to install rather, and that's why they're being used. When those codes were all combined and the standards were dropped, you know these buildings were uh, you know, being built all over the place, and these 13R systems were the norm. Basically, um, they're there to to give some temporary relief get people out of the building and then they're disposable beyond that and also standpipes they don't have any in there so Parker Place 13R system
no standpipes. You got to go into that building and you got to lay a ton of line to get anywhere in those buildings. So in essence, these, these sprinkler systems are made to protect the occupants, get them out, and rebuild. And there we go, Parker Place. So this is what their sprinkler risers look like. On the left is the dry riser, and on the right are three wet risers. So this building is interesting because it kind of has two different occupancy types. The center portion has uh, an industrial kitchen and uh, an assembly use area. So that building has a stronger, more stringent code versus the two residential wings. Now in those residential wings, there's the actual fire doors that separate. You know, if the fire alarm kicks off, magnets close or open up and those doors just close with automatic closers. So this dry system, this riser here is a, uh, that just controls the attic in the center of the building. So the attic on either either side beyond the center portion is completely unsprinklered. And that's because once it gets to the, the flanks of the building, it becomes a 13R system. Here's a closer look at uh, the dry system valve. All right, so this is the center attic portion within the the uh, occupancy group that requires it. So you'll see this sprinkler, this is the dry section inside the attic. You'll see the exit sign right here, and then this door. So this door here basically takes you um, to the next residential wing where there's no longer um, sprinkler uh, protection. And then this is an example of the other side of that door. So, you know, in here is a giant attic and you've seen this building, it's, it's, it's enormous. And let's just say that maybe this giant bundle of Romex catches on fire and overheats, or this lighting in here, or this loose insulation gets overheated from the wiring running through it, or the, uh, the stacks that carry the, pl the plumbing vent, um, those are PVC. Let's just say a, a fire starts in a wall and there's no, um, there's no void space protection because it's a 13R system and it gets up into this attic. What, 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 it, what are we going to do for this building? We're basically going to get in there, try to clear out as many people as we can, make our stand at the, at the hallway, and uh, almost write this building off. As crazy as it sounds, but I would at the very least, any instance where there's active fire or sprinklers going off in a building like this, First thing I'm going to do as an incident commander is, you know, is get up to that attic to make sure it's not burning in there. And if it is, that's going to change a lot of stuff. Um, and these are, these are pretty, pretty nasty buildings. So. All right, and here's um, a closer look at this building. This building's attic with some of the Romex and communication wire running through it. So, basically. That's all I have in regards to this type of construction. So, uh, just in quick uh, review, you know, know your buildings, know some of the elements of this type of construction, know that your operational times can and should be much lower than in the conventional or legacy type building, know where your conventional and legacy type buildings are, and, uh, you know, rely on you know, quick thinking and quick water supply, make a quick hit, try to hit things from the outside if it's not working, then you might want to consider, you know, moving your operation to defensive and writing these types of buildings off. You know, it's not worth, it's not worth our lives. All right, well, uh, that's basically all I have, and I want to thank you for paying attention, and have a good day.